Animals fascinate us. We love the way they behave and often laugh at their antics. Their behavior can make us feel happy, sad, and even frightened. But can they feel emotions too? Do they experience love, fear, sadness, and anger? Until recently, scientists were ill-equipped to study emotions in animals. With advances in neuroscience, they are now able to enter the inner life of the animal kingdom. For centuries, humans regarded animals as unthinking, unfeeling lower orders of life on Earth. Animals were little more than living robots, ruled by base instincts and hormones. Ancient philosophers believed animals responded like biological machines to their environment. Little separated them from inanimate objects like a table or chair. They were emotionally empty, incapable of the simplest feeling. Human prejudice hardened into dogma. This suited scientists because they feared being accused of the sin of anthropomorphism, applying human characteristics to animals. So humans were considered the only sentient beings on Earth. Animals, the argument went, rode purely on instinct. In the past, a scientist would explain away this chase in dogmatic terms. Zebras are aroused by a specific stimulus which gives rise to flight behavior. Today, scientists reject such language. They take a more generous view of the animal world. Science has opened up the very real possibility that the zebra's flight is motivated by fear, an emotion that enables them to escape danger. Not only are animals endowed with emotions, but these emotions play a vital role in their survival. So what exactly are emotions? Unlike feelings, they're physical and come not from the heart, but the brain. Emotions are neural impulses. Like an engine, they power the organism. Modern scientists believe emotions actually control animals, helping them to bond so the young stay close to their mothers for protection and adults stay clear of danger. Fear is the one emotion most readily experienced by animals. Even emotional skeptics pay lip service to its evolutionary advantages. Fear commonly triggers defensive behavior, avoiding a threat rather than confronting it. Without fear, the wildebeest might stand idly by as a lion chews its leg. Fear is genetically ingrained. It's a function of the nervous system, and it provokes two types of behavior, fight or flight. The body language of fear is easily recognized in humans, but also in animals. Dr. Joseph Ledoux, a neuroscientist at New York University, has spent the past 15 years looking at rats to see what happens inside their brains when they're afraid. The reason fear is so easy to study and then so uh, productive as a topic for research is that we have uh, very good methods for eliciting fear and measuring fear. So um, if you have a stimulus and you have a response, it's very easy to follow the stimulus through the brain and get to the response. 
Witness emotion in action. Emotions like fear produce chemical and physiological reactions that come hardwired in the body. When the wood rat detects a predator, its heart beats faster and hormones flood the body. The control room for all this physical activity lies deep inside the brain. A tiny almond-shaped area called the amygdala receives danger signals and trips physical reactions around the body. When the danger passes, fear subsides. Normal behavior resumes. All mammals and birds follow the same emergency drill. Dr. Bernd Heinrich is a world expert on ravens, the largest member of the crow family. He works with these highly intelligent birds both in the wild and in captivity, and was at first surprised by the emotional reaction they showed to their favorite food, carrion. When I looked at the adult ones in the field where I started, uh, I put out calf carcasses, and it took, sometimes took days before they'd go down. They'd be so afraid of them, they wouldn't go near them unless they were in the in the crowd sometime, or unless somebody else was there first, and they wouldn't go near him. So I couldn't imagine how he had a carcass specialist being afraid of carcasses. I thought they were just the opposite. This wasn't an isolated case of food phobia. Dr. Heinrich has been feeding this pair in the same place for some time, and yet the ravens are still wary. This jumping jack behavior is an obvious sign of fear. Imagine a rabbit being afraid of carrots. Ravens exhibit the same seemingly irrational response to their favorite meal. If they were always so terrified of eating, they would surely starve to death. The problem with these birds is they're neophobic. They're afraid of new things. Anything unfamiliar causes them to panic. The birds patiently evaluate anything they haven't seen before until they overcome their fear and seize the day. Dr. Heinrich also raises young ravens in an aviary. They show no such worries. They go for anything. The young ravens even compete for new objects until their curiosity is satisfied. Scientists have added curiosity or interest to the range of emotions they think animals are capable of. Though poorly understood, curiosity probably encourages exploration, attention, and learning in young animals more than older ones. Curiosity, by definition, is, is looking at new things and, uh, and trying to find out about them. If you define curiosity of examining new things, then, then ravens are very curious, especially when they're starting out after they come out of the nest and they manipulate different objects. And it's a way of, uh, functionally, it's a way of testing what the objects are, <coughs> whether or not they're good to eat, actually. And I've done experiments with that, and, and they are very eager to examine things that they, that, that they are unfamiliar with, that they have not contacted before. And after a while, uh, they will totally ignore things that they were very familiar with. Ah, ah. 
Curiosity might kill a cat, but young ravens thrive on it. It drives the search for food, helps them understand what might harm them, and avoid things of little interest. In a sense, curiosity is the opposite of fear, but it doesn't last forever. As the birds grow up, their curiosity wanes. Dr. Heinrich experiments with young and older birds. Here he films young, tame birds to gauge their reaction to a wind-up mouse. By the time they're four months old, the ravens already show signs of shyness. As they grow into adulthood, the birds become completely neophobic. Their emotional makeup changes radically with age. Youthful curiosity encourages exploration and learning. Later, fear will help them avoid potential threats. Dr. Mark Beckhoff, a biologist at the University of Colorado, likes to see the positive side of a negative emotion. I don't ask the question if emotions have evolved. I ask why, what they're good for, what function. So I think the point is really to help develop bonds and attraction or repulsion between individuals. I mean, I love trees and I love rocks, but I don't love them the same way I love a dog or a cat or a wolf. And I think it's because we don't have the shared emotions. So I think it's the sharing of these emotional states that's very important in the bonding and the keeping, uh, to keep a group functional. Not only the positive emotions, if you will, but the negative ones of pain and fear and, um, say, anger. Emotion is a power that binds animals, just like people, together. Packs of wolves live in relative peace because emotions rule their society. Every member knows its place. Rules are enforced through dominance and subordination. Without fear and aggression, large social groups in the animal kingdom would break up. At the river mouth, the bears catch only the tastiest, most tender salmon, which is exactly what we want. Humans often find themselves in conflict with nature. Animals too get angry, and not always over food. Social mammals like the olive baboons in Kenya's Masai Mara National Reserve often resolve conflicts peacefully. A glance here, a gesture there. The male urge to dominate includes threat and counter-threat. This can quickly escalate into violent, sometimes bloody aggression. Aggression is the outward manifestation of anger. What goes on inside the body is much the same as when animals feel fear. So whenever we're in a dangerous situation, there's a stereotype response in the body. You know, sometimes we call it a stress response, defense response, fear response. It's all the same thing. So muscles tense up, um, blood pressure and heart rate tend to rise, uh, hormones are released. The neural responses in the brain and body are fast, hormones are slow. Uh, and while slow is a disadvantage, uh, what they do is they keep you locked into the emotion for a longer period. So they're slow, but they, they continue, and, and that's a good thing. Like fear, anger lurks in the amygdala part of the brain, which triggers the body's fight-or-flight response. 
heart rate and blood pressure rise. So does respiration and body temperature. Blood rushes to the muscles and other vital organs to prepare for action. It also flows away from the skin to reduce bleeding in the case of injury. The body is flooded with stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. This puts animals in a heightened state of alert. Anger and aggression in nature evolved for a reason. An aggressive animal wins more food. It also increases its chances of mating and protecting offspring over a wide territory, all of which spells survival. If it pays to be aggressive, costs must also be borne. A mean set of canines makes fighting extremely dangerous. Most adult males bear scars. But too much aggression would create intolerable levels of stress and might tear a baboon society apart. If anger and aggression help build territories and social hierarchies, they must be kept under control. An antidote is at hand, appeasement. Many primates turn to grooming to restore peace and tranquility. A gentle hand cements social contact. It's an emotional moment for such animals and it's driven by endorphins released in the body. Endorphins are a particular type of amino acid called peptides. They're produced in the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus of the brain. They act like opiates, creating a sense of well-being and a mild high in animals and could also serve as a painkiller after a fight. If domestic cats purr with contentment, lions hum softly when they play, lick or rest. Unseen, endorphins work their magic to strengthen social bonds and keep the peace. Our wild relatives may seem innocent enough, but there's more going on in their minds than meets the eye. Arnhem Zoo in the Netherlands is paradise for primatologists studying chimpanzees in a controlled yet natural environment. Supper time is anything but calm. The promise of a meal causes great excitement as the screaming and body language show. Dr. Franz de Waal, one of the founders of the zoo, puts their behavior into context. Well, chimpanzees, when you introduce food, they go through what I call a celebration. So when you arrive with the food in captivity, uh, all the chimpanzees will come together, they will be hooting, they will embrace each other, uh, and sometimes they groom each other if they have to wait a longer time. And then when the food comes, they share the food. And I always think that these celebrations have to do with a, partly with excitement, but also with the reduction of aggression. As aggression drops, the chimp's sexual appetite increases. In chimp society, food and sex are closely related. They go hand in hand. The more food there is available, the more there is casual sex. But food provokes other less attractive emotions, like envy. So strict rules need to be observed if the group is to remain peaceful. Once the subordinate has put her hand or his hand on the food and has the food, 
it will not be taken by the dominant. The dominant will respect the ownership. If, if the other one is an adult, if the other one is juvenile, then the, it's, there's no respect for that. So yes, there is a, what, what used to be called in primatology respect of possession. Once you possess it, uh, others will have to beg. And so even the highest ranking male will have to beg for his food if it's in the hands of a low ranking female. Chimps can look, but not touch. If patience is little more than a virtue, how about dropping a heavy hint? The young find it difficult to sit idly by. Young tempers flare when adults don't want to share. Some chimps try more subtle approaches. Lending a hand sometimes results in favors, but not always. At the end of the day, chimpanzees are highly social, so they do like to share. They seem to know the value of give and take. I think for chimpanzees, food sharing is um a way of fostering relationships. And so I think a lot of the food sharing has to do with reciprocity, has to do with repaying favors, either from previous food sharing, or from grooming, or from support in fights, or for sex, or whatever it is. There's all sorts of reasons in a chimpanzee society to make friends and to keep friends, and I think food sharing plays a role in that. Share a meal, keep a friend. Chimps use food to make friends and gain influence. Animals of the same species often cooperate to survive. Cooperation between species is rare. Nature is essentially selfish. While humans and chimpanzees are restrained by social codes, most animals have no scruples about doing whatever is necessary to survive. Animals live by their wits in a complex world where intelligence and cunning are often the key to survival. Envy, desire and greed are powerful emotions that compel animals to act to get what they want, even if that means provoking anger and disappointment in others. In human society, greed is one of the seven deadly sins, something shameful which is best controlled. Scientists at the Primate Research Center in Strasbourg are studying whether animals can control their desires.
a capuchin monkey faces a choice. It's offered the orange, but like many primates, it would prefer the banana. The choice is this. If it waits 10 seconds and returns the orange, the banana will be his. Wise decision. For humans, the certainty of a quick swap would be enough to pass up the orange. Monkeys find self-control far more difficult. Most, not all, will control themselves for the 10 seconds. After that, they cave in. The truth is that in the wild, monkeys make no provisions for the future. All available food is eaten immediately. Greed is far from being a sin in the wild. It allows animals to take full advantage of available resources. Human etiquette, like politeness, which make our world tick, would doom animals to extinction. Emotions like greed rule the jungle. Then comes love. They say that love is blind, which is just as well for some animals. Love may be the most uplifting of all emotional states. But let's not beat about the bush. It's actually just nature's way of keeping the species alive and kicking. Love comes in three flavors, lust, attraction, and attachment. Lust initiates the process of mating, and any partner will do. It's the driving force behind reproduction. Attraction allows individuals to choose a specific partner. Rather than coveting everything that moves, finding the perfect partner conserves energy and time for more mating. A genuine attachment between the sexes provides the icing on the cake. Attachment allows individual animals to cooperate with a mate until parental duties are over. If love is in the air, so too are feelings of intense desire and attraction. That feeling of wanting to be near someone all the time. Of seeing only the good side and of looking beyond mere appearances to the inner beauty of your partner. Over the past 20 years, scientists have shown that love really is a drug. It's literally all in the mind. Neural chemicals create a cocktail of potions for every kind of love, from lust to romance and long-term commitment. But don't expect an elephant seal to feel that love is forever. They want to copulate all right, but after a short post-coital cuddle, they'll go their separate ways. The sight of a potential mate tells the limbic system in the brain to dispatch chemical messages to the reproductive organs. Sex hormones kick in, testosterone and estrogen course through the body, and mating begins. More durable love comes in the form of a bond between parents and offspring. This kind of love is associated with the drug oxytocin produced by the pituitary gland in the brain. When mammals go into labor, 
the fetus stimulates the birth canal and releases oxytocin into its mother's nervous system. The oxytocin present at birth allows mother to bond with baby. It stimulates milk production and nursing. Every time baby sucks, more of the drug is produced, which reinforces the bond. <laughs> Typically for most mammals, the father of the pup plays little or no role in parenting. His job is done after copulation. Only a tiny number of mammals form lasting partnerships in the natural world. Birds are different. 90% of birds form monogamous relationships and albatrosses are no exception. They descend from the Pacific skies to land on Midway Island near Hawaii every year around November. Hundreds of thousands of them. So what's all the song and dance about? An albatross lives most of its life at sea. They land here to pair off and breed. They depend on long-term, even lifelong attachments to produce offspring. For a female, finding Mr. Right is a big decision. Personal hygiene is a plus, but it's not everything. The chemistry has to be right. In the early stages of the breeding season, the reproductive hormone, testosterone, is in overdrive. Scientists believe testosterone promotes courtship in birds generally. But don't expect love at first sight. A female albatross takes her time to choose a mate who will help bring up her chick because she won't lay another egg for two years. It will be vital for the chick to have two parents. The male must have good genes and be attentive to the offspring. When the female finally lays her egg, the male will spend much of the next two months incubating it. It's at this stage that scientists believe another hormone kicks in to cement the partnership. As the level of testosterone in males drops, it's replaced by prolactin, a hormone that triggers parenting behavior. A high level of prolactin in both male and female is present throughout the incubation period. But the real test of enduring love has yet to come. The chick will depend on both parents equally to ensure its survival. For the next seven or eight months, mother and father will take turns nursing and feeding. Lower levels of testosterone at this stage mean the male is less interested in other females. The hungry chick taps on its parent's beak to feed. If parental devotion were measured in miles, the albatross would win feet down. It will fly up to 4,000 miles over several days to find food. Little surprise then that a happy chick is one with two loving parents on a good dose of prolactin. Love protects the young, compassion protects the weak on land and at sea. Carnivores must kill to live. Some scavengers don't wait for death to tuck in. It's all part of the cruel cycle of the natural world which animals live and die by. But sometimes they challenge their fate.
adult penguins come to the rescue of one of their own. Are they aware of the danger and distress? It would seem so. Out of compassion or curiosity, the ailing bird quickly finds itself surrounded by family. It's impossible to know what they're thinking or feeling. But their behavior speaks for itself. They won't leave the bird alone. Perhaps they do know that if they leave, other predators will finish it off. The victim appears to give up. The others don't. If this is not compassion, then perhaps animals can't be aware of the effect their actions have on others. Can they really know how their fellows feel? To know how others feel, you must first be aware of yourself. An animal may know something, but does it know that it knows? Is it self-conscious? The ability to think about oneself creates self-awareness. A mirror demonstrates the challenge for animals. Even monkeys cannot recognize themselves. Only our closest relative in the wild, chimpanzees and orangutans, demonstrate any evidence that they do see themselves reflected. So if most animals do not possess self-awareness, are they capable of understanding another's feelings? Empathy can sometimes cause an upwelling of emotions, but not all animals are capable of such feelings. For centuries, we underestimated animals. Today, we may be guilty of wishful thinking, mistakenly giving them qualities that only we have, the old sin of anthropomorphism. In India, the Hindus revere millions of long-tailed monkeys called langurs. They're the incarnation of the god Hanuman. When one dies, it's given an elaborate funeral, adorned with garlands and sprinkled with ochre. By contrast, a langur's reaction to its own dead is at best ambiguous. A mother gives birth to a stillborn baby. She looks more puzzled than grieving. It's too easy to assume the mother feels deeply for her loss and impossible to share her thoughts. Is she even aware that her child is dead? Even scientists can't answer that with any certainty. After all, the mother might think the baby is just behaving a little strangely. Others in the troop seem to understand that all is not well. Are they sad because we would be in a similar situation? Many scientists assert that humans really are alone in possessing self-awareness. One way of realizing this is in our own reaction to death. We live in the knowledge that one day we will die. Animals seem to live in blissful ignorance. While we perform elaborate funeral rites for our dead, some animals also appear to understand death.
Many scientists are convinced that elephants are intimately ruled by their emotions. They're one of the rare animals for whom death means something. They show visible signs of grief. When an elephant gives birth to a premature baby, the mother and relatives show genuine distress. Unlike langurs, they seem to realize that the baby teeters between life and death. The family tries to drag and lift the baby to a shady area out of the burning sun. But their efforts are in vain. They'll spend the next three days watching over its lifeless body. There's no doubt that um, elephants, for example, grieve and bereave, if you will, over the dead uh, carcass of another elephant. I don't think in order to grieve that they need to know that the animal's not coming back. I don't think they need to know about the concept of death as we know about the concept of death, because in fact, in humans, there's a variation in the concept of death. Some people believe in reincarnation, so death is just a transitional stage. So I don't think it has to mean permanently gone, but I do think that elephants are very aware, as are chimpanzees and dogs, when another individual is gone. If we turn our backs on animals' emotions, we could find ourselves faced with a whole host of complications. Awareness in domestic animals can be a problem for pets and their owners. Dr. Nicholas Dodman at Tufts Animal Hospital in Massachusetts tries to help both parties. As a veterinary surgeon and pet psychologist of sorts, Dr. Dodman's clients come from hundreds of miles to consult him about their problematic pets. It starts. Including Hazel. Her owner, Laura, is definitely the dog's best friend. But their close relationship has turned out to be a problem because Laura is unable to leave her alone. When she does, Hazel goes from docile to demented. Having destroyed her house and her car, Laura is obliged to keep Hazel in a kennel when she goes out. When I leave, as soon as she figures I'm gone, she panics. I do leave her for about an hour at a time in the kennel, but I feel bad the entire time. And I've, you know, I've read every book, I've done research on the internet, I've done all different kinds of things, and nothing works. Dr. Dodman is positive animals get emotional in the full sense of the term. He diagnoses Hazel as suffering from separation anxiety, a neurological condition brought on when Laura leaves even for a moment. And that is the bond between you is so intense that parting becomes sorrow. And, uh, you know, that's not good. So it is a form of depression. I mean, when you leave, I, I believe she thinks that you've gone forever, yeah. that she's alone again. He prescribes a course of behavior modification and drugs to treat animals like this who have become too attached, what he calls a Velcro dog.
Common symptoms of separation anxiety include howling and barking, destructive behavior, excessive salivation, even anorexia. Studies point to a link between anxiety disorders and specific areas of the brain. Drugs can have an effect. Serotonin reuptake inhibitors, a type of antidepressant, work by retaining the level of serotonin in the brain. Serotonin is known to reduce levels of fear and anxiety. Dr. Dodman uses this type of antidepressants on his canine clients. Neurological studies have confirmed what many of us always suspected. Animals do have emotions. Say so. People always think they can read their pet's mind. Body language speaks volumes. Fear, aggression, greed, curiosity, and of course, love, are all part of the emotional range animals may well feel. In the wild, animals too are full of emotional expressions. Emotions play a vital role in survival. Scientists have finally dared peer right inside the natural world to think the unthinkable. Animals have emotions just like us.